evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, a very warm welcome to you uh, to this joint lecture uh, of the Q Society and the Richmond Local History Society. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Roger Mason, uh, Chair of the Q Society, and I'll be introducing our speaker this evening. Uh, Robert Smith, the chair of the Richmond Local History Society, uh, will take over the meeting after the lecture and uh, chair questions and uh, discussion. Now, a word about asking questions. Um, if you want to ask a question, please type it into the question and answer box uh, for which you will find a button uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please do not uh, post it in the chat box. Uh, I noticed one or two people are already making comments in the chat box. If you want to put those as a question to our speaker, please uh, retype in the question and answer box. Otherwise, you uh, may not uh, find that your question is answered. So the message, use Q&A, but do not use chat. Now, the um, uh, Q Society and the Richmond Local History Society have held uh, several joint lectures over the last three to four years, and they have proved uh, extremely uh, successful. Uh, I can see uh, already that tonight's uh, lecture is going to be very popular. Uh, there are 191 people who've tuned into it uh, so far. So thank you very much for uh, joining us. Of course, many of you will be members of one or both of the societies, Q Society and Richmond Local History Society. Uh, many people belong to both, but there will be a number of people tonight who have joined us who are guests uh, who are not currently members of either society, uh, but are interested in the topic. Um, I would urge you, if you are a guest and not a member of uh, one of the societies or both of them, uh, please consider joining the societies. Uh, you can find out a great deal about the societies on their web pages uh, for the Q Society. Uh, just go to qsociety.org on the web and you'll find a lot about what the Q Society does uh, and also uh, how to join. So I invite you to do that and uh, uh, to, to join. Uh, we would very much uh, welcome that. I'm sure that Robert Smith, uh, the chair of the uh, Richmond Local History Society, will tell you about his society at the end of the lecture. Now I want to welcome our speaker for this evening. Um, our speaker, uh, is uh, a well-known local historian, uh, Robert, uh, I, I'm sorry, Stephen Bartlett. Um, Stephen has lived in Kew for 25 years or more. Uh, and during that time, he's become very interested in the built environment of Kew in the Victorian and Edwardian eras. Uh, he's written uh, for example, two articles on the Victorian mansion Royston House that was on Kew Road at one time and its neighbours. And these were published in the journal of the uh, Richmond Local History Society called Richmond History, uh, which is available from either the society's web page uh, or from the Kew Bookshop uh, or from Open Book in Richmond. Now, based on uh, those papers that he published back in 2018 and 2019, he gave us an extremely interesting talk about uh, Royston House uh, and its neighbours in 2019. Tonight, he's going to explore the uh, history of uh, Lawn Crescent, uh, which also is featured in one of his articles in the journal Richmond History, published in the 2020 edition. So uh, Stephen, I'm going to hand over to you now. 
Uh, we're looking forward to a very interesting uh, lecture from you. So over to you, Stephen. Thank you very much, Roger. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, wherever you are. I'm sorry that we can't meet in person as we usually do. Um, but for boringly well-known reasons, we have to meet virtually instead. Um, but we are very fortunate tonight to have the excellent technical support of the National Archives, who are going to do the difficult bit, as you might say, and I only have to talk. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to disappear in a moment because um, we want you to be able to see as much of the presentation screen as possible. But don't worry, I'm going to come back at the end when you have a chance to ask questions. Um, and that part will be chaired by Roger, uh, Robert, I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, I think without further ado, let's see if we can get the show on the road. Five acres, one rood and four perches. I hope you're all up to speed with your roods and perches, as this is a talk about a piece of land. In fact, it's a talk about this piece of land outlined in red here, which we know today as Lawn Crescent. And you'll see those of you who are familiar with the um, geography of Kew, you'll see the botanical gardens on the left, Kew Road going northwards up to Kew Green, and then Lawn Crescent here with Sandicombe Road, as we now know it, on the right hand side. And that's a bit of land I'm going to be talking about. So what I'm going to talk about is, first of all, what was there before it became Lawn Crescent. Then I'm going to say something about how Lawn Crescent itself got built. Um, then I'll look a little bit at the architecture. And finally, very briefly, at a couple of the people who lived there. So let's begin with the agricultural past. And if we spool back, so to speak, to 1771, this is the Richardson map of the Manor of Richmond in 1771. This is a very useful map. Um, it is, by the way, uh, in the local archives, local studies library, and they have digitized it at high resolution. So it's a very convenient reference point. And you'll see here again on the left is Kew Gardens. Here is Kew Road going up to Kew Bridge up the top. And here is the bit of land that I'm talking about on the right hand side. And this is Sandicombe Road going up here was known then actually as Dark Lane for some reason, and then later Sandy Lane. And notice everything to the right-hand side of Sandicombe Road was in fact in a different parish. This is the parish of Mortlake, so nothing to do with Richmond. The border goes down the middle of the road. So if we take a closer look, here is our piece of land. It's a field, a single field, with the number 851. And this is actually very convenient because this enables us to link it to the land tax records of the time, uh, which are deposited in the uh, Surrey History Centre. And that enables us to find out who owned it and who was working the land at that time. And you'll see that at that time, the map has noted that these two fields belong to the Engelhart family, which were a prominent local family in Kew. And the land around them uh, was owned by the Selwyn family. And they would in fact own these fields as well a little bit later on. And so most of the Engelhart land was in fact uh, a little bit further north. Um, it's the bit now which has got Gloucester Court and other things on it. Um, so this was a little exclave of Engelhart land surrounded by the Selwyns. And in 1806, the Engelhart family, for some reason, decided to sell the land to a man called Matthew Payne, who was a butcher in Richmond. 
In fact, the, the Payne family were butchers in Richmond for 150 years or more, uh, and they were quite wealthy. Um, and Matthew Payne, who bought this field, uh, didn't actually use it himself. He rented it out to a local tenant farmer, um, who we know from the land tax records was called Charles Barber, uh, who died in 1833. And um, Matthew Payne's life, unfortunately, didn't go entirely smoothly. Um, not that anybody's does. Uh, in 1823, his wife died. And for some reason, I don't know why, he moved to the north of London, to Edmonton, and he eventually remarried. The rest of his family stayed in, in the locality of Richmond. Um, but he, for some reason, went to North London and he died in Woodford in Essex in 1837. Now, Matthew Payne didn't have any children by either of his wives. And when he died in his will, a copy of which still exists, uh, he left shares in the land to some of his nieces and nephews. And I've outlined them in heavy black on this partial family tree here. And the important thing to know about this land is that it was copyhold land which was like a kind of um, indefinite leasehold, the freehold of the land belonged to the manor of Richmond, which is why we saw it on the manor map. Um, but the copyholder could do what he liked with the land and it wasn't limited to so many years. Uh, he had theoretically some obligation to the local manor, but um, the practical importance of this being copyhold is that whenever the land changed hands, uh, the new person taking on the land would have his or her name entered in the manorial role of the manor of Richmond. And in that way, we get in fact a complete overview of everybody who owned or had an interest in the land. Um, including, in fact, all these uh, nephews and nieces that you see outlined here. Um, that means that there are, in fact, 17 documents from 1839 up until 1885 that record the admission of copyholders when a nephew or niece died or uh, decided to sell the land to somebody else or whatever they did to it. And of course, the nephews and nieces didn't work the land themselves. They also leased it out to tenant farmers. Um, considering that there were actually only, there were seven of them, but it wasn't a very big piece of land. It's only five acres. Uh, it would hardly have been more than an allotment as far as any of them were concerned. So they jointly leased the whole thing to tenant farmers of whom the most long standing was a man called Arnold Aldridge. And eventually the area around, in other words, the Selwyn lands got built up. Um, the Selwyns began building in about 1870. And a piece of legislation had been passed that allowed copyholders to buy the freehold of their land from the Crown. And by 1886, this piece of land must have looked rather odd because it had buildings all around it, basically. And so in 1886, the nephews and nieces decided to enfranchise the land to buy the freehold and they paid 700 pounds for the crown for the freehold. And in fact, here is the document, the enfranchisement document that still exists. And it's a rather wonderful document. If we open it up, um, it's a big piece of parchment, all this lovely spidery writing. And you'll notice in the middle on the left hand side is a map that shows in this little pink uh, square over here, 
the piece of land that we're talking about, um, bounded by uh, Kew Gardens up there, the Selwyn Estate here, and Sandicum Road there. And down the bottom right hand side here, you've got the seals and signatures of all of the remaining copy holders, which is rather a nice thing to see. Well, no sooner was the ink dry on this rather magnificent document than they decided, having bought the freehold, that they would sell it. And so the next year they sold the land for £4,450 to the trustees of something called the Southwark Freehold Land and House Property Association. And for reasons of not getting tongue-tied, I'm just going to call that Southwark Freehold Land in future, but that's its full title. And this document records the sale. Um, up at the top here, you'll see the names of the uh, surviving copy holders, one of whom, Louisa Ellsley, I think it was, was one of the original copy holders in 1839, and she survived right the way through uh, to 1887. And then here on the right hand side, you've got the names of the three trustees of Southwark Freehold land, William Anderton, John Weston and William Butcher. And so this document still exists, uh, detailing uh, all the toings and froings with lots of whereases. <laughs> so that means that we have, in fact, a uh, fairly complete picture of who owned the land and what was done with it, all the way from, uh, you know, from 1800. Uh, right up to the point where houses began to be constructed on it. Um, so that when the, when the land was in the ownership of the Engelhardt family, um, it was being, um, being tilled, as it was agricultural land, by a man called James Cluley, who in fact was uh, some rather notorious man. He had been tax collector in Kew and he seems to have pocketed quite a lot of the taxes that he collected. Um, but from uh, the time that Matthew Payne took it over, it was Charles Barber and then eventually Charles Aldrich, who was in fact the elder brother of Arnold Aldrich. And Arnold Aldrich farmed it uh, from uh, 1850 or so right down to the time when the freeholders sold the land in 1887. He actually farmed a much bigger piece of land as well. To begin with, he lived on the land on Lawn Crescent, uh, but he then later on moved and he uh, farmed Manor Farm in Petersham, which is a much bit bigger piece of land, where he died in 1901. So that's what happened to the land before it was uh, built on. And the only other piece of information that I have about what the land was used for was that when the first ordnance survey was taken in 1861, the surveyor walked the uh, boundaries of uh, the parish together with the parish reevesmen and he noted in his uh, notebook as he walked that this piece of land was in use as an orchard. He wasn't any more specific than that, unfortunately, but the latest record that we have is that in 1861 it was being used as an orchard. So let's go on and have a look now at how it got built. Well, it was built to a single plan. The Southern Freehold land was not a builder's company, it was an investment vehicle. And what they did was they bought land, they built houses on it, and they sold them as freehold properties, hopefully for profit, and then they moved on to other areas of London. Now, they did this by commissioning architects to build, uh, to design the houses, and they then engaged builders to construct them. 
And in this case, with Lawn Crescent, they started on the south side of the Crescent. Um, but not everything, unfortunately, was to go to plan. They engaged a builder called James Dillaway, who was originally from Islington. And he started on the south side of Lawn Crescent. And by 1890, the local Kelly's directory shows that uh, nearly all of the houses on the south side of the Crescent had occupiers. And in fact, 1890 is the first year in which anybody is recorded as living there. And by the census in the next year, 1891, nearly all of them were occupied. But the rest of it didn't go so smoothly. They engaged another builder to build the north side and the west side. Uh, he was a man called J.W. Richardson, and quite honestly, I have no idea who he was. And it's doubtful whether he actually started. And so a bit later on, they had to engage another builder called Thomas Woodson Woodson, uh, who was originally from Newcastle. Um, and he was due to build the north. He may have built, I think he built some of it. It's not clear exactly how much he built, but he defaulted on his obligations. And the Southwark Freehold Land were pretty upset about this. I read a long deposition by the secretary. Um, and so they had to eventually find a third builder, a man called James Clark of Prusen Street in Wapping. Now he wasn't exactly an angel either. He was actually hauled up before the vestry in Richmond and fined for building houses with inadequate materials, they said. But anyway, he did do the job. And by 1893, the west end of the Crescent was occupied and the following side, the northern side of it, uh, filled up, starting, roughly speaking, at the east end. And the only problem from the point of view of the Southwark freehold land was that many of the people who were occupying these houses were only renters. And in fact, some of them were fairly short term. And Southern Freehold Land, of course, their aim was to uh, sell the freeholds and get their money back or make a profit. And so by 1895, they were beginning to get a bit restless. Uh, they had sold some of the houses to freeholders, but 19 of them were still unsold, which locked up their capital. And this is, in fact, a plan that shows the 19 houses uh, in pink that were unsold at that point. Notice two things here. Uh, those of you at home who are standing on their heads will see that in the middle is uh, this magic lawn tennis ground. And the more observant will have noticed there's a whole bunch of houses here down the right hand side bordering immediately on Sandicum Road because the bit that uh, Southern Freehold land built didn't actually stretch all the way to Sandicum Road and it's what we now know as being the uniform crescent that makes up Lawn Crescent and I'll talk about this bit a little bit later on. So what they decided to do was of course to hold an auction and they put a advertisement um, announcing this in the Times, as one would, of course, about this attractive locality close to the stations and gardens. Uh, freehold villa residences all let to good tenants. So it sounded absolutely wonderful. Unfortunately, it didn't sell at auction. And so they still had a problem. But at this point, you could hear the US cavalry galloping over the hills and enter someone called Mr. George Meyer. And Mr. Meyer had a plan, it was possibly even a cunning plan. 
He would buy the freeholds of all 19 houses for £9,700, but in a joint venture with the governors of something called the Bounty of Queen Anne. Um, those of you who are local may have heard of this before. It was a charity set up by Queen Anne to provide an income for poor clergy. And his plan was that he would put up nearly half the money and Queen Anne would put up the others, other half. And when the purchase went through, he would then assign the freeholds to Queen Anne's bounty and they would grant him in return 99 year leases to all these houses. And why was this a cunning plan? Well, first of all, the Southwark freehold land would get their £9,700 and they would then be finished with Lawn Crescent and could go on and do something else. Secondly, Queen Anne's bounty would get the ground rent from these 19 houses, uh, which is actually what they wanted because that was how they operated. And uh, he would get the head lease for the 19 houses, which he could then rent out as best he, he saw fit. Uh, and he would get the income from that. And Queen Anne's bounty knew what they were getting into because a few years earlier, they had bought the freeholds of nearly all of the houses on the Selwyn estate all round this. So they were already familiar with the property and familiar with Kew. So what could possibly go wrong? Well, unfortunately, quite a lot. And let's just have a look. Who was this George Maillard? Well, in 1901, he's recorded in uh, Gunnersbury in Silver Crescent as a widowed visitor, age 67, uh, born in Chard in Somerset, of a lady called Sophie Norris a widow of 53, born in Marylebone, who is living in Gunnersbury with her 12-year-old daughter, Beatrice, who is born in Paddington. And that's all fine and dandy. But there's a little problem in that uh, Mr. Maillard doesn't appear in any other census. And there's no record of his birth in Chard, or anybody with the name of Maillard, come to that, um, or of his death anywhere under that name, nor of the death of his wife before 1901. And so at this point, one begins to smell a quite considerable rat. And what I decided to do was to go to the census 10 years earlier, the 1891 census, and search for a lady called Sophie, then aged 43, born in Marylebone, and with a two-year-old daughter called Beatrice, born in Paddington. And this is in fact what gives us some clue as to what was going on, because here is the 1891 census, and it's a bit hard to read, I'm afraid, but there is Sophie, and she is 43, as we would expect, born in Marylebone, with a two-year-old daughter called Beatrice, born in St Pancras, uh, and in fact with three other children. And she claims that she is called Sophie Cornelius, and she is the wife of George Cornelius, a greengrocer who, oh look, is born in Chard in Somerset. And in fact, if we go to the records of Chard in Somerset, we can quite easily find a baptism of George Cornelius um, in 1834, the son of John Cornelius, a shoemaker. So Mr. George Cornelius is bona fide, and we can in fact um, follow him forwards in time through the censuses. And in 1861, for example, here he was not far from Chard and Tatworth village, uh, and he is married to a lady called Anne. He is a boot and shoemaker, and also notice a grocer, uh, born in Chard, as I say. And 
this pattern continues. We can go forwards another 20 years. And in 1881, George and Anne had moved from Somerset up uh, to Beckenham in Kent. And there they are, he's still a bootmaker. Uh, so something must have happened between 1881, when he was married to Anne, and 1891, when he was apparently married to Sophie and living in London. Um, and there is no record of the death of Anne Cornelius during that time. In fact, if one searches the 1891 census for Anne Cornelius, she pops up in Eastbourne, perfectly hale and hearty, uh, as a uh, boarding house keeper. And she, in fact, uh, survived George, as we will see. So what seems to have happened is that soon after the 1881 census, George and presumably Anne moved into London to Maid of Vale, and he opened a a shoemaking shop on Formosa Street in Maida Vale. And things didn't go very well. And not very long thereafter, um, he was petitioned for bankruptcy in 1884. And probably at that time, if not earlier, Anne hot footed it off down to Eastbourne. And it's also significant that this was Maida Vale because Maida Vale must have been where George met Sophie. And Sophie's father lived not far away in Maida Vale. And later on, when George Cornelius, in the form of George Meyer, bought the houses in Lawn Crescent, uh, he gave his address as, in fact, the address of Sophie's father in Maida Vale. So what we know about George Meyer is that he was a pseudonym. He was really George Cornelius, a bankrupt shoemaker from Somerset. He was estranged from his second wife. He was living with a woman who wasn't his wife and had other children by him. In fact, although his name does not appear on their birth certificates and who had another child by somebody else. And he very definitely wasn't the gentleman of substance that he claimed to be. So how could he afford to buy the 19 houses? Well, as one does, he took out a mortgage. Um, and I'll show you this because it clearly shows here the numbers of all the houses and they tally with what was on the uh, auction map. In fact, George Maillard's era of ownership of, of these houses in Lawn Crescent was rather short lived. He bought the freeholds in 1886, and to do so, he took a large mortgage from three farmers in Norfolk, 5,500 pounds, which was more, of course, than he uh, was putting up to, uh, for his share of the purchase. For some reason, he also took another mortgage uh, a month later, and that's actually the one that I just shown you for a small sum from an auctioneer in Hampstead. Not quite sure why, but evidently he was not successful with his business venture. Perhaps his tenants didn't pay their rent as promptly as he would have liked. Uh, I guess that he got hit for, uh, for cash flow reasons. But at any rate, uh, in September of that year, after only nine months of ownership, he was obliged to sign over his leases uh, to a solicitor called John Arnold Stoughton, who I'm fairly sure was in fact the, the solicitor for the three farmers in Norfolk. And so with that, uh, Mr. Meyer's hopes of property riches were over, at least as far as Lawn Crescent was concerned. But it's actually quite interesting to see what happened to him thereafter. Uh, things didn't get any better. In 1900, he was in fact made bankrupt a second time, this time um, through creditors who applied to the bankruptcy court in Wells in Somerset 
in respect of property that he owned down there. And he wrote them a charming letter saying he was terribly sorry he couldn't come to the court hearing. He got no money, so it was impossible for him to come down to attend the hearing. And he got in further hot water after that. Two years later, he was hauled up in court accused of fraud. But then he did a very silly thing. He went on the run. And of course, PC Plod charged after him. And a few months later, he was caught giving rise to the deathless title, Maya found at last. Uh, notice incidentally that uh, these two newspaper reports are the proof that George Cornelius and George Maillard were one and the same person. Um, in fact, his troubles didn't stop there, but eventually he died in 1908. He was living in Wilsdon by then. This is his death certificate. It is witnessed by Sophie Cornelius, his widow, uh, which in fact she wasn't, of course, she was his common law wife. Um, and he is recorded still as a house and land dealer. So he evidently didn't give up on property speculation. Um, bearing in mind that he was bankrupt twice over, he must have been an exceptionally persuasive person to have kept going. Uh, his real wife, Anne, survived him, as did Sophie, um, and Anne died two years later in Kent, and to make things more difficult for people like me, she'd taken the first name Rhoda by that time. Um, however, I tracked her down, so she didn't succeed in uh, in hiding. So from then on, the story of Lawn Crescent gets a little bit simpler. I mentioned Mr. Stoughton, the solicitor. Well, he held on to the leases of the 19 houses until 1898, when eventually they were sold to another investment vehicle called the Properties Investment Trust Limited. Uh, Queen Anne's bounty remained the freeholder, but over time from then on, uh, some of the occupiers bought their freeholds and settled down for longer periods. And similarly, uh, some lessees bought the head leases. And so by, 1830, uh, by 1935, the Properties Investment Trust only had nine of the leases left. Now, they were probably not very good uh, renters. The lawn tennis ground, which I pointed out in, in an earlier slide, had fallen out of use quite early on by about the First World War. And it appears then to have been neglected by them, presumably because it didn't bring any income. Um, and so this caused some annoyance with the local uh, residents of Lawn Crescent and eventually they set up a trust company and they bought the freehold from Queen Anne's Bounty and the Properties Investment Trust and decided to manage it themselves. And at this point the clamour of those of you shouting what about the rest of it are growing a bit louder so let's have a look at the rest of it. You'll remember that in the auction map of 1895, uh, there were houses indicated along Sadikam Road. But in the second Ordnance Survey map, which was surveyed in 1893, they're not there. Um, and that's the, the pink bits here in this, um, in this map. And so, I think it's clear that those houses, in fact, or that land rather, was not um, was not sold to Queen Anne's bounty. It wasn't built on by Southwark freehold land. It was instead built by others and was owned by others. Um, in fact, as we see today, the houses are all in a different style from Lawn Crescent. They look much more like the houses around them. Uh, and there are planning applications that survive from 1893 and 1894, 
by the local architect Robert Messenger and the builder George Wilcox uh, on behalf of somebody called Mr Harry Hayes. And I've no idea who Mr Harry Hayes was. And if there's anybody who is listening tonight uh, who lives in 242 to 268 Sandicombe Road and especially 242 to 250 or Mortimer Terrace, who, anybody who's got their original documents and would be prepared to let me have a look at them, that would be highly interesting because I think that's about the only way we'd ever find out who Harry Hayes was. We know who George Wilcox was, however. He was a builder. He was actually based in Bournemouth. And he also got into trouble because here is a uh, notice of a receiving order for bankruptcy made against him in 1896, by which time I think he'd finished building most of the houses. And this definitely links him to the property because he's described as lately trading at Lawn Crescent, Sandicombe Road, Kew Gardens, and Gordon Lodge, Stanhope Gardens, Bournemouth. And that is probably, although I couldn't swear to it, the reason that the first house, 260, uh, is known as Stanhope House. And we know from the plaque on the side of it, it was definitely built in 1894. And so most of the houses were occupied by 1897 and the valuation survey of 1911 showed that the freehold belonged to something called the Scepter Life Association. So no longer freehold, no longer Queen Anne's Bounty. Um, that then is the history of that little bit of road, not entirely cleared up, but it's different from that of the main part of Lawn Crescent. And let's just have a look at the main part of Lawn Crescent and its architecture in particular, because this is the most striking thing about it. As I mentioned, the Southwark Freehold land engaged architects to design the houses that they built. And the ones that they engaged for Lawn Crescent were called Newman and Newman, and they were comparatively prestigious. This is the entry for them, Arthur Harrison Newman and his cousin Dudley Newman in the Directory of British Architects. Uh, notice that both of them were made fellows of the Royal Institute of British Architects shortly after they had designed Lawn Crescent. I don't think that was cause and effect, but it was around the same time. Um, and it shows that they were in fact reasonably solid and, and well-known architects. And their work includes uh, several churches, some of which survive. Uh, St Mark's Deptford on the left is still in use as a church, so is St George's Westham Park, and so is St Peter's Bounces Road in Edmonton. And all of these are solidly Victorian Gothic revival, nothing like Lawn Crescent. And uh, they also built civic buildings. Uh, the first two of these, the Ladywell Institution and Willesden Town Hall, don't survive. But Willesden Library does, a bit of it does anyway, and that's it. And that also doesn't look at all like Lawn Crescent. Uh, so evidently Newman and Newman were flexible in the styles that they adopted, but neither of these really gives the clue as to why Lawn Crescent looks as it does. And if we remember what the streets around it look like, uh, those of you who know the area, top left is Litchfield Road, built by the Chamberlain brothers in the 1870s and early 80s. Um, top right is in Ennerdale Road, built by James Moore Lucas in the 1880s. Uh, bottom left is Holmesdale Road, um, built um, in again the 1880s. And bottom right is the semi detached houses in the Avenue, also built by James Moore Lucas. And none of those look anything like Lawn Crescent. But of course, Lawn Crescent was built 
some 10 to 15 years after these houses and fashions had moved on. And this is the original design that Newman and Newman provided. Um, and this was submitted at the end of 1888. And it was submitted to Richmond Vestry. And it's very unusual that planning applications before 1890 survive because 1890 is when the borough of Richmond uh, was uh, brought into being and the planning applications that we have are mostly from that year onwards but for some reason very fortunately this one survives and uh, it was approved by Richmond Vestry and let's see what got built. That's what got built and in fact it looks remarkably like what the architects had designed. So they did what it said on the tin, so to speak. And these houses are very different in style from the ones I've just shown you. Um, if we look in detail at them, they're semi-detached houses. They've got uh, front doors which are in a shared porch under a, a circular arch. Uh, notice, by the way, the red and black tiles of the pathway leading up, which you may have remembered from St George's earlier on. Um, the facade is quite different. They've got very steep roofs with dormer windows. All the windows are white painted wooden casement windows. Uh, there's a balcony at first floor level, also white painted. And if you look very carefully, in the upper lights of some of the windows on the ground floor, there are small panes of coloured glass. So all very distinctive and different. Where might this have come from? Well, possibly it came from here. Bedford Park was an estate that was built between uh, roughly 1875 and 1886, so just before Lawn Crescent. Uh, designed by the very prestigious architect Richard Norman Shaw and Edward J. May. Um, and he was enormously influential on architects of the time. And you can see that these houses from Bedford Park have many of the same characteristics, very steep roofs, dormer windows, no uh, Dutch gables in Lawn Crescent, but nevertheless, dormer windows in steep roofs, the white uh, casement windows or sliding sash windows in this case. Notice here the little coloured glass panes in the upper, uh, upper lights of these windows and the balconies at first floor level, white paint balconies. So possibly uh, Bedford Park may have influenced Newman and Newman in their design of Lawn Crescent. Well now let's go on and just briefly as time is running on um, have a look at a couple of the people who lived in Lawn Crescent when it was completed. Uh, this shows some of the uh, occupiers of the first couple of decades or so and quite honestly they're not terribly exciting people. I mean they're widows and retired clergymen and commercial travellers and clerks and bankers and this kind of thing um, but there were one or two who were a bit more interesting. Uh, these were semi-detached houses as I say and uh, that made them a bit more affordable than the big houses on Kew Road or on uh, Ennerdale Road and some of the other roads around. And so some of the members of the Royal Botanic Gardens were able to afford to live in Lawn Crescent at one time and another. And one of the first was Robert Rolfe, uh, who was an expert on orchids and was uh, the deputy uh, at the herbarium. And he was actually one of the original freehold buyers and he lived in Lawn Crescent for a long time, for 30 years and eventually died there. But two of his other 
colleagues, both of them mycologists or experts in mushrooms for some reason, um, lived there. Samuel Wiltshire lived there also for a long time and also died uh, number 24. And then there was one other, the Arboretum propagator, Charles Coates. I couldn't find a picture of him, so I put a picture instead of the camellia, which is named after him. And then there were one or two other people who were more interesting. There were a couple of musicians, and one of them was an or organist called Thomas Mee Patterson, who lived actually in two houses on Lawn Crescent. Uh, over a period of 15 years. He was organist at uh, St Mary's in Ealing and I thought you might be amused to see and hear the following. It starts with no sound, don't worry about that. So there we are, just an extract, that's what you might call cue the music. If you want to um, hear the full thing, it's about five and a half minutes, you can find it fairly easily on YouTube. Now there were other um, residents who were of some interest uh, and these are they. I'm not actually going to talk about them today. Um, perhaps the best known was the women's rights activist Helena Swanwick, um, but you will find them described in the article that accompanies this talk uh, in the latest issue of Richmond History, the Society's Journal. Um, and if there are any of you who haven't bought this, and I find that hard to believe, uh, it's on sale in all good bookshops like Q Bookshop, for example, and I believe in the bookshop of the National Archives as well. So I thoroughly recommend buying that issue, but you'll find more about those people in that article there. So to sum up what we've heard about Lawn Crescent, um, it's just a single field from olden times. It was built on as speculation and it didn't go entirely smoothly, but uh, it was built by, I think it's fair to say, a fairly uh, enlightened speculators in that it was architect designed. Uh, it has a distinctive and uniform style. Uh, it, it's a style that endures to the present day. It hasn't changed significantly since it was built. And it was designed by Southwark Freehold Land um, to have this attractive open grass centre. Uh, they could, after all, have built another bunch of houses on it and made some more money, but they decided to uh, go for a more upmarket and pleasant and secluded style. And so it remains to this very day, in fact. And the key thing about his history that I've been able to pass on to you is that 19 of those houses were sold to Queen Anne's bounty. And that's the reason that we're able to unearth this history. It is that the documents that record this 
have in fact many of them remained with Queen Anne's bounty, which is known nowadays as the church commissioners. And so they're still in the archives of the Church of England, where I have been on a number of occasions to go and look at them. So there we are, that's the story of how Lawn Crescent came into being. I thank you for your attention and there will be a short pause while we reconfigure electronically um, in order for you to ask any questions you might have. Good evening, can you all hear me? I'm Robert Smith, I'm chairman of the Richmond Local History Society. For those of you who don't know about us, we cover not just Richmond, but also Kew, Petersham and Ham. I think we'd all agree that Stephen has been meticulous in his research. He's delivered yet another first class talk to us and has made us all realise just how much, how many, how many interesting things there are to look at when we walk past houses and streets in our local area. I think we have some questions for Stephen which have been submitted via, via the Q&A uh, button. Uh, the first question is from Helen who asks, if you are aware Stephen of the connection between Lawn Crescent and one of the major stories in the Richmond First World War home front, more specifically, and speak, um, uh, did you know that one of your Lawn Crescent addresses was the temporary family home of a Belgian young man who figures in a rather touching love story, which we see as symbolising the essential Anglo-Belgian experience in our boroughs in the, in the First World War. Did you I have to admit that I didn't know about that. Um, and I can only say I think it would be splendid if you were to write that up and submit it to the Society's Journal. I'm sure that Robert would be very interested to have that as it's his nice personal story. There were, of course, um, a lot of people who lived there that I couldn't find because, for example, uh, Kelly's directory only notes the name of one person in the household, even though there may have been several other people living there. And so it's very easy to miss somebody, particularly if, for example, they weren't there when a census was taken. But that sounds a fascinating thing. Good. Second question was, when did the tennis court get used? <laughs> Only very early on, I think. Um, I mean, really, I, I, I think it, it perhaps was a bit embarrassing for people to go and play tennis in front of their neighbours or something, particularly in crinolines or whatever they wore at the time. <laughs> but anyway, it didn't, didn't seem to last very long. And is it true that some of the houses were damaged in um, World War II? and then later rebuilt? Uh, uh, I'm not sure. I, I, I have to be honest and say that I actually stopped my researches at the outbreak of World War II um, because I didn't want to get into the area where you start um, writing about people who are still alive. Uh, uh, that's just a, a, a convention, if you like. Um, I, I, if they were rebuilt, they were certainly rebuilt to look as they did before, um, because the the style is very uniform all around the crescent. There's one observation here, really a question is, were they jerry built? Because the um, questioner here said, when we moved to Kew in 1974, we desperately wanted to live in Lawn Crescent. The survey on one house we, we, we offered for remarked that there were no proper foundations for these houses, which rather put us off. In other words, were they jerry-built? Well, I did earlier note that um, the gentleman who built some of them was uh, fined for having built his houses with poor materials, according to the Richmond Vestry. So that might be part of it. But I understand that the, the ground there is also not perhaps as stable as it might be in places. And Stephen, do you know when the original railings were removed? Was it for the war effort? I have read that, yes. 
um, in one of the pieces I, I, I came across. Um, somebody here saying not so much a question, but this person's found out recently that one of the architects of Bedford Park lived in Long Crescent. He thinks number two, although the numbering of the houses was reversed at the time. Um, can't remember the name, but he's listed on the information stand at the roundabout at Turnham Green Station. <laughs> I must hurry to turn Green Station. It's entirely possible. One of the frustrating things is that um, Lawn Crescent, like some other streets in Kew, was in fact completely renumbered in 1895. And so that, for example, what we know as one Lawn Crescent today was originally number 57 and so on and so forth. And that makes it rather difficult to track uh, occupiers through time, but there, there was in fact an architect um, who lived in number two. His name was Frederick Barclay Miller. Whether that's the same one or not, I don't know. Why were the houses re re renumbered in Long Crescent and other places? Uh, I honestly don't know. I mean, it was not just Lawn Crescent uh, because Litchfield Road was renumbered as well. And so were other roads um, going, they were, I think roads going east-west. I think that the post office just decided that it had got it wrong and it wanted to do them the other way round or something. But it, it, it makes life a bit of a pickle for anybody trying to find out what went on. But there are actually certificates that were issued to householders um, that, uh, that verified the fact that they'd been renumbered officially. Do you know whether the lawn was used for growing food through either, either of, the, of the World Wars? Uh, um, I don't know. It, it's quite possible, I suppose. Um, somebody here says that they live between 250 and 242 Sandycombe Road. What was the connection with Lawn Crescent? And you mentioned somebody called H Harry Hayes. Could you, could you remind them what, what the connection was? Well, Mr. Harry Hayes would presumably have been the owner, um, but I've not been able to find out who he was. And that's why I, I said, if there's anybody who lives in that bit along Sandicombe Road from 242 up to 268, uh, who's got their original deeds, it would be very good to see them because that would probably tell us who Mr. Harry Hayes was. Uh, one question is, what seeded your interest in Lawn Crescent? Um, I think really it was walking into it and thinking, gosh, this place is really so different from all the rest of Kew. I mean, there are some other houses um, from, from that period and onwards. For example, um, uh, there are the one or two in Burlington Avenue and one or two um, in, in other streets which have some similar features, which have like white painted balconies or uh, white painted windows, that kind of thing. Um, but really Lawn Crescent stands out from everything else, partly because it, it makes such a, a homogeneous uh, impression, this whole crescent, all the houses looking the same. Somebody else said that they were given the same uh, Jerry built advice in 1974 and the mortgage company refused to help, so they went somewhere else. <laughs> and another uh, former resident of number 13 said that when the river was high, I sometimes got a trickle of water through the basement. <laughs> well, that's, that's a great pity, but I'm, I, I'm sure that's possible, yes. <laughs> um, I know that um, Kew Garden Station isn't where it was, where it was originally meant to be, and uh, one question in here has made the point that um, uh, a proposed location for the station at Old Station Yard was abandoned because the ground was not suitable for its foundations. I didn't know that story before, but I knew that the... Um... No, no, indeed. Um, so we, we have a publication called Q at War, one of our publications. It mentions where all the bombs fell on Q and uh, one of our members has reminded us that none of them fell in Lawn Crescent. 
Um, so I think you know. I think you know where the Belgian question came from, and the lady who gave it would like to um, talk to you off uh, off uh, off offline about that. Indeed. Um, would you know anything about the green design and uh, tree planting in Bourne Crescent? No, I'm afraid not. Nothing at all. Uh, but I should imagine that the trees are probably original. Um, if you look at the trees along Kew Road, the Selwyn estate, um, a, a good number of the trees along Kew Road are actually the original ones from the 1880s. So it's quite possible that these in Lawn Crescent are as well. And one of the people here tonight lives on the corner of Lawn Crescent and, part of, and uh, they're part of the committee that manages the Lawn Green. And they say that the current residents and the committee um, are incredibly in, in, in invested in maintaining the lawn and its trees. And we do put on a cracking social calendar every year. It would be good to add that to the Lawn Crescent history in case anyone else wants to research a, any, any specific house. Um, well, if they do, perhaps I could just say um, one thing, which is that I have deposited with the local studies library uh, spreadsheets that show the occupants of all of the houses from 1890 down to World War II. Um, and also I've deposited with them a, 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 a GEDCOM file which contains partial family trees for many of those people. Not all of them, but many of them. And I think I know the answer to this question. Well, actually, well, the question is, what's your next talk about? I know you've got some, some more research you're doing <laughs> when, when uh, lockdown's finished. Will it become a talk? And, well, and what's, what's, it, what's the area of research, please? You never know. Uh, it's frustrating, of course, at the moment, one can't do anything because all the archives are shut. But I would love to write up something about the architect who designed and the builder who built the parades in Kew, for example. Those are the other side of the road, so they're more plate. They're all completely different, nothing to do with Lord Crescent. Um, but actually, they're quite interesting. And there are other parts of Kew I'm getting interested as well, like the Priory Estate and the roads north of Mortlake Road. So um, it would actually be quite interesting to be in touch with people from that area. There are, I'm sure, interesting stories up there as well. Indeed, indeed. I think that's all the questions. We're losing a few people. There may be a rival offering started <laughs> on ITV, I think. I think uh, we, we did, we did, have, we did have 195 people who all stayed for your talk. Now down to 135, but it's still pretty, pretty good. Um, Stephen, you gave a talk to both our societies um, two years ago as um, Roger mentioned, on Royston House, the mansion that once stood on the block flats where you live now. And you said then that, although you're not a trained historian, your, your curiosity about the history of that site that spurred you on to find, to find more. I hope there are other people in this audience who are curious about the history of where they live and are encouraged by Stephen's example to do their own research as, uh, as well. Thank you for an excellent talk. As a token of our appreciation, I have a little something to, which I will deliver in person to your flat tomorrow. <laughs> Good gracious. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Normally I, I would give it to you on, on, on the night. I would go there as part of my primitive daily exercise. <laughs> um, thank you very much indeed. Thank you everyone for coming this evening. Hope to see you all again soon.